Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with another lecture. Great players of the past, also great player of the present, although <clears throat> he's present on the earth, but he's not playing great chess anymore, but he still plays on the internet. Um, he plays like me now, except better. Uh, the name is Ulf Anderson, and we want to thank our sponsor, Yeroen Paper. Uh, thanks for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen. The more you contact Karen, the more lectures you can sponsor. Ulf Anderson's uh, peak performance, in my opinion, was in the 70s and 80s. But he was also good in the 60s and 90s. And he kept playing chess in the 2000s. Um, then probably around 2010, he like, stopped playing in tournaments where you would see his name. Um, I guess he plays here and there. But um, Ulf Anderson was top five in the world at his peak. And he's won games against several world champions. As you can see from his Wikipedia page, he's won many tournaments like Reggio Emilia and Vicanze and Rome and Phillips and Drew and Hastings and Buenos Aires and so forth. Um, and he's won the Swedish championship many times and he's played in many Olympiads um, for Sweden. And I think almost always board one, if not always board one. Now, Ulf Anderson has a very unusual style for a top 10 player is he has a lot of draws and plays in a very tame style. He likes positions that he likes. He likes boring positions and he's not offering a draw. He just likes to play positions that are sort of drawish. And he was winning a lot of games in 70, 80, 90 moves and he would have the occasional game that would go over 100 moves. So he was playing for a win, just not in positions where there was a lot going on. Um, he liked trading pieces and getting a slight advantage and pressing his opponent. So he doesn't have a lot of wins that are sharp tactical melees, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have any. Occasionally, that's, you got to play the position you're at. Um, he also was a great correspondence chess player. Um, playing where you had to mail your moves. Now they do on the internet. And he was one of the top players in the world in correspondence play also. Um, and he was the, uh, what word do I want to use? He was the toughest opponent for Yasser Sarawan. Whenever Yasser talks about which players he beats the most and which players he loses to the most, Ulf Anderson is always at the top of his list of somebody he just couldn't play against. Styles clashed, I don't know. Their styles are actually pretty similar, I think, but maybe Ulf was just a little bit better. And he doesn't have a big Wikipedia article, which is strange because he was one of the top players in the world for quite a long time, and he won a lot of big tournaments and beat a lot of world champions. So should have a bigger, a bigger uh, Wikipedia article. Maybe I'll add to it. He was born in 1951, like another famous player. In fact, we just put a repeat of his lecture on my YouTube channel, Anatoly Karpov, also born in 1951. And this is the 50th anniversary of Wolf Anderson becoming a grandmaster. He became a grandmaster in 1972. And he's 71 right now. Okay, so let me um, flip the board if I know how to do that. Okay, so the first game I want to show you is probably Anderson's most famous game. Now, you have to realize there's going to be people in the YouTube chat who are furiously writing, you already did a lecture on Anderson. Why are you doing another one? Rawr! And they're mad. They've never been so angry at the free content. And the answer is, that was another Anderson. And actually spelled his name differently. That was Adolf Anderson. And he was born over 100 years before Ulf Anderson. So actually, 1950, yeah, he was born about 100 years before. And Adolf Anderson was a good player in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s. And he was one of the top 10 players in the world. So I guess we're looking for a new Anderson coming up in a few years. There's always an Anderson in the top. Um, that was Adolf Anderson. He spelled his Anderson differently than Ulf did. Um, and also Adolf Anderson played wild and crazy chess, and Ulf Anderson did not. Okay, so... Uh, for, for this game, which lasted almost 80 moves, I want to get to two different positions, okay? The first position 
is going to be like a typical kind of hedgehog position. And we'll get, we'll just fly by the opening and we'll get to the middle game. Okay. And this is the first position I wanted to talk about. Ulf Anderson has a lot of games where there's a lot of strategic maneuvering. People move around and around and around. And then when they fall asleep, Ulf Anderson wins on time. That's one way to win. And uh, Ulf Anderson liked to play sacrifices that were strategical in nature, not because he was sacking a piece and mating you, not because he was sacking something and getting three connected pass pawns in the center. He liked to sacrifice um, typically either a pawn or the exchange, or in this case both, because he wanted to get a positional compensation and get better pieces. And that's a risky way of playing because you're down material, but Ulf Anderson was really good at it. He was good at understanding the positional strategical compensation if it was worth more than the material that he offered. And here, um, Anderson and Karpov are both the same kind of player, very strategical, slow, methodical, which you can see from this position. Um, this was actually pretty late in the game. I think this was move 24, even though it looks like both sides have made about 12 moves. They were moving their pieces around, trying to find the correct squares. And finally, uh, Anderson played a, a tactical idea. He played the move d5, which is a very common kind of tactic um, in the hedgehog formation, which you'll see is denoted by all these pawns on the third rank, which defends everything on the fourth rank, which makes it hard for white to infiltrate anywhere. And Karpov is just playing very solid and not trying to win right away, just build a little bit of a space advantage. Now d5 doesn't sacrifice the d-pawn, which it usually does, otherwise you play d5 all day. In this particular position, the a6-pawn isn't protected, so once white plays cd, he can take the pawn on a6. So normally, if black doesn't want to sacrifice material, but still wants to play d5, <clears throat> he would have his bishop on b7, defending the a6-pawn, make more sense. So he's saying, you can take my A pawn, that's okay. I'm going to have good compensation in the center. So Karpov took the pawn on D5, and he probably expected Anderson would just take the pawn back on D5, and they would trade some more pieces, and eventually I would take this pawn on A6, and White's just a pawn up. And this is where Ulf made a shocking move, although I guess as time goes on, and we see more computer games, didn't see any computer games in 1975, um, and we see more uh, young grandmasters, grandmasters in their teens, playing very energetically, We're, wouldn't be surprised now as we were in the mid-70s at such a move. And Anderson played after bishop d6, he tricked me attacking this h-pawn, knight f1, and then he sacrificed his rook on e3. Sacrificing the exchange, always sacrifice the exchange. And Anderson was an unusual player in that he liked to play slow, methodical, boring chess, but he also liked to sacrifice the exchange. But he would sacrifice the exchange because he would say, I get the dark squares, I get the better pieces, I get the activity, and I don't really care about your rook right now. Your rook's not doing very much. Um, now, this sacrifice is just to get the dark squares, which are very weak. I have a nice dark square bishop on d6, and I have a lot of diagonals that I can put my bishop on to control a lot of squares. And with the white pawn on d5, black actually isn't interested in taking it because it's blocking the white rook. White would actually prefer not to have this pawn on the board. Just get that pawn out of there so that the rook would have a nice open file. And then the knight would have a square on d5 for later also. And the bishop would have a square on c4. So that white pawn is actually blocking white's other pieces and black's going to play around it. He took with the knight. Bishop takes h2. Now Karpov 
doesn't have to take the exchange. He could save his H pawn and take with the queen, but that would allow bishop f4, and black gets his exchange back, and black's probably going to get his pawn back on d5 also. Then white's king side looks a little shaky. So he decided, I like being up the exchange. You can take my H pawn. And he kicked out the bishop. And this is a pure exchange sacrifice. Black got the pawn on h2, but black never recaptured on d5, so black doesn't have any extra pawns. So not only is white up an exchange, this pawn on a6 also isn't defended sufficiently. And Anderson thought this was good for black. He said, my minor pieces are better than your rooks, which, well, I always say always sacrifice the exchange, so I agree. I like minor pieces better than rooks in the early middle game. When your pieces are moving around, the rooks are really good in the end game. So if they trade queens and trade some minor pieces, then white's going to be much better. But until then, black is just going to have a safer king and more active pieces and better control of the dark squares. Okay, and I want to zoom ahead to the next position, which is many, many, many moves later. Many. Okay, and they got this position where Karpov is still at the exchange for no pawns. So nothing's happened. They just moved around a lot. And in this position, black wants to play knight f3 check. So Karpov played knight d2, defending f3 and defending his e-pawn. Okay, unfortunately, since black is dominating the white squares, black has a chance for bishop to b4, pinning the knight to the rook. And if it was black's turn to move, black would play bishop takes knight, and then it doesn't matter which way white takes, black's going to play knight f3 check. Although white doesn't want to take with the queen, because knight f3 check would win his queen. But in any case, black's going to get all his material back, and, and then some. Okay, so Karpov played king f2, which prevents knight f3 check. It's not check, it's hanging. Okay, using his king to defend. And finally, um, Anderson gets his material back, and he has a better pawn structure and a safer king. He just takes the knight and takes on e4. And finally, black is clearly winning. Black is up a pawn. White has three isolated pawns, and white has a king that's not easily def defendable. Now, of course, Karpov's a pretty good defender, so the game took a long time from here. And Anderson was never in a hurry. And this is something when I was teaching a lot of chess to private students, I would try to inspire them to not be in a hurry, but to gradually improve your position. Although Anderson took it too far. Anderson wasn't, was in less of a hurry than I am. And I'm not in a hurry. But Anderson, he didn't care if the game went 200 moves. He liked to play chess. He liked to move the pieces around. So there was a lot of repeating at, at the end of the game where nothing happened for a long time. And man, for my always repeats, Anderson was my, would be my number one student. So basically nothing ever happens. They just move around and he's, it's like Anderson isn't interested in winning. He just wants to keep playing. He likes his position. He surrounds the white king. Finally, he's attacking the white king. Still likes to repeat a lot. Always repeat. And in this position, after queen f3 check, because the knight's not defended on e2 by the rook. If you remember two moves ago, the rook was on e3. Well, the white king was getting checkmated like queen g2 is mate. So he moved his rook here so his king could escape, which it did. And unfortunately, now his knight's not defended, so Karpov resigned. If Karpov plays king to d2, there's rook a2 check. And you can't move your king because your knight's not defended. And you can't block with the rook because the king is overworked. And you lose a piece. So after queen f3 check, Karpov resigned. And that game took about 80 moves, which I sort of blew by most of it because we don't have time for a five-hour lecture. Um, 
And Anderson won a lot of games in a long period of time by moving around and around and around, very similar to Karpov, slowly improving his position, but not doing very much, not doing anything to hurt his position. And he wasn't in a hurry. And a lot of his games ended up in draws because of that. And because of all these things that I'm saying, there's certain people like me, and there's other people, maybe you, who are fans of Anderson. Unfortunately, there are people who are not fans of Anderson. They don't like that style. They don't like moving around and around and around, nothing much happens, and the game is a 75 move draw. They find that boring. And even when Anderson wins in 70, 80, 90 moves, they also find that boring because they don't understand something very clear cut happening. Like usually I sacrifice a rook and then I mate my opponent on the back rank. They understand that. I sacrifice a piece, they take my piece and I promote my pawn to a queen. People understand that. I fork my opponent's king and queen, I win their queen, they resign. People understand that. But when you beat somebody in 70, 80 moves by slowly suffocating them, the way that Karpov liked to do, then they don't necessarily like that as much as somebody who's sacrificing material all the time. That's why Anderson would throw in the occasional exchange sacrifice to spice it up a little. But he was interested in peace activity and strategy, not in necessarily giving his pieces away. Now, this match was played in 1995, 20 years after, and it's the same players, the same deviled egg, this is the game Ulf Anderson Karpov. This time Karpov is black, Anderson's white. And this was a match they played, you know, like a fun match, not for the world championship. In 95, the players were much older than in 75, but Karpov was still like top three in the world, maybe even top two. And Anderson was probably somewhere around 10. And uh, don't blink, because even though Ulf Anderson like to play long, boring games, that was assuming, you know, you weren't hanging mate in one. If you hang mate in one, Anderson will mate you. And one of the reasons Ulf Anderson is a great player is he almost never blundered. To beat Ulf Anderson, you had to beat him in the opening, middle game, and end game, and you had to outplay him tactically because you weren't going to outplay him strategically. So he had a lot of draws, but he had very few losses and he would beat the best players in the world all the time because he played with such so few mistakes. And obviously, if you're the best, second best, or third best player in the world, like Fisher, Karpov, Kasparov, the giants of their time, and you're paired against Ulf Anderson, you're not necessarily looking for a draw. If you're me or you and you're playing Ulf Anderson, maybe you are looking for a draw. So if you're not looking for a draw and you're making sure the game's not a draw, that's a good way to lose. Okay, you got to play the position. You got to play good moves. You can't just say, I'm Karpov. Nobody's better than me. Or I'm Kasparov. Because if your opponent doesn't make any mistakes, then you better not make any mistakes either. Okay, now Ulf Anderson, again, very similar to Yasser Sarawan, likes to play flank openings and likes to play g3 and c4. So the first seven or eight moves of any Ulf Anderson game, you're likely to see knight f3, g3, and c4 in some kind of move order. Okay, even when he's black, that's how much he liked it. No, just when he's white. And when he's black, he liked to play the hedgehog and play very solid and just chill and wait for his opponent to make a strategical mistake or a tactical mistake. Now, the other game with Karpov is more famous because Karpov was the world champion. It was the first game Karpov lost as the world champion, the game that we just looked at. And Anderson sacrificed a pawn and then the exchange. And the exchange sacrifice confused most people. They were like, why do you give up the exchange? What's going on here? Okay, this game is much easier to understand, but it's not in Ulf Anderson's style. The best players who ever lived, they have a way that they like to play but they can play any way they want to. Tall was famous for sacking all of his pieces, but he'll beat you in a boring endgame also. He would just prefer to do it the other way. Okay, Karpov liked to play solid also. 
So we have a queen's gambit accepted. I've had white in this position many times. Castles, a6 is one of the moves. Queen e2, takes, takes. And we've seen these kinds of positions all the time. White has an isolated pawn, but white has good activity and black is very solid. And this is the kind of position that you would expect both players would have from both sides. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the game Karpov Anderson instead of Anderson Karpov. This seems like just, just the way they play. Now, most super grandmasters nowadays, and by most I mean all of them, when they prepare openings, they have their engine by their side. Okay, they're using engines, they have coaches, the coaches have engines, the engines have engines, the engines' engines have engines, and they make sure when they play an opening that the engine says, yep, that's good. That doesn't lose by force. However, Karpov and Anderson aren't from that generation. They were playing chess mainly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So when they played in the 90s and people were just starting to use computers, Anderson and Karpov said, no, thank you. We'll, 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 we have our own prep. Okay? And occasionally, uh, if you were somebody who was top in the world in the 70s and 80s, if you were playing in the 90s and 2000s, you would play an opening that has since been refuted by computers, and you don't use computers, so you would just lose out of the opening. Okay, that could happen. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately for us, unfortunately for Karpov, something like that happened. He played knight c6. Looks reasonable. Rook e1. And this is really good because it looks like it's pretty boring. Nobody's threatening anything. Nobody's doing anything. And when I was mm, learning chess and getting better at chess and becoming an IM and becoming a GM and my rating was going up, when I studied openings, one of the most important things I did was not memorize variations because I couldn't necessarily remember all the variations, but I would memorize key ideas. So I would say, oh, every game that black wins, these things would happen. Every game that white wins, these things would happen. And so in these kinds of positions, if we trade a lot of pieces and we get to an end game, black's going to be better because white has an isolated pawn. But if white's sacrificing on e6, and sacrificing on f7, and doing a rook lift, and playing for checkmate, and playing d5, and attacking, sometimes white would win those games. So black was trying to make the game boring and have a better pawn structure, and white was trying to make the game exciting and take advantage of the rook and the queen opposite each other, and the fact that my knight has the e5 square, my bishop is bearing down your king, so white's trying to be aggressive, and black's trying to be solid. And I guess Karpov forgot that. Okay, and Karpov played knight to b4. He's covering d5. He's opening up his bishop. Okay, he wants to play knight d5 with massive exchanges, and so forth. And unfortunately for Karpov, this whole line has been discredited. You can't play this line. Okay, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, maybe you could play this line. But then people said, wait a minute, this line loses, you can't play it. And I guess Karpov didn't get the memo, but somehow Ulf Anderson did. Because not only does Ulf Anderson like to sacrifice the exchange, he likes to sacrifice a pawn if it gives him strategical play. And he played the move d5, and actually white's already winning. This is a losing position for black. You can't ignore the pawn. There's too much pressure on e6. Otherwise, you just lose everything on the king side, and the bishop on b3 is going to be crushing. Now, the problem with taking the pawn on d5 is you're running into all kinds of pins and tricks. So you have to figure out here how to get tricked the least. The most obvious way to lose is to take with the pawn, and now you know why on the previous move, Ulf Anderson played rook f e1 because now the bishop is just hanging on e7. So the e pawn is pinned. You can't ever play e takes d5, because I'll take your bishop on e7. It's like the e pawn's not even there 
for defensive purposes. Unfortunately, when you take with a piece, your piece is pinned to your queen. So computers already figured out and super grandmasters figured out you can't play this way with black, but Karpov didn't know that. I don't know if Anderson knew it or he figured out d5 wins. He played knight takes d5, knight takes d5. And once again, we have a big problem here. And Karpov just lost really quickly um, so that I guess I could show you the variations. Otherwise, if Karpov played one of the more complicated lines, we'd have to we'd look at what happened. So he played the very simple bishop takes g5, knight takes b4, and white's up a piece. Like, that's it. White just won a piece. White has three pieces and black has two. So that's, Karpov didn't really do anything of note. Again, if you take with a pawn, white has more than one way to win. Bishop takes is pretty brutal. Attacks the queen, attacks the rook, attacks the knight, and white is up a piece. So that's, I guess that's the worst way to lose. If you take with a bishop, then you're pinned. I take the bishop on e7, although I guess I should take the bishop on d5 to be more accurate. I'll be more accurate. Knight takes, bishop takes. You can't take with the knight because your queen's hanging. So you take with the queen, and then your e-pawn is still pinned. You can't take the rook because of the pin on the e-pawn. And if you play knight takes, it's the same thing. Bishop takes. You can't take with the knight because your queen's attacked, and the e-pawn is pinned. So Karbov just losing out of the opening to Ulf Anderson. And Ulf, not known as the tactician, but Ulf is looking for the move d5, because d5 is often a strong move in this opening. And it's really strong because Ulf played rook f e1. I have no doubt that Ulf Anderson knew about this already, and that's why he played rook e1. Because there's other moves white can play here. White can play a3, bishop c2, d5, knight e5. I think the reason he played rook f e1 is he knew knight b4 lost to d5. He knew that the e-pawn was pinned. The e-pawn's not pinned now because the knight is defending the bishop. That's why knight b4 is a blunder. And I guess Karpov just thought, well, knight b4 defends d5 even more. So it's got to be good. But unfortunately, it undefends the bishop. So the e-pawn is pinned. Whatever you take with here is pinned. And you're just losing right away. Karpov lost very quickly. Knight d5, taking advantage of the pin again. And Karpov just resigned here because he's down a piece for a pawn. He didn't want you guys to suffer. So Ulf Anderson, known for winning in 80 moves, beating Karpov in a miniature. Now, I wanted to show a game that has a clash of styles. Okay, because Karpov and Anderson, pretty similar. They played a lot because they were both in the top 10 in the world in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They played a lot of the same tournaments, so they played a lot of games with each other. So if I want to show you Anderson beating a world champion, Karpov's my first choice. Okay, um, Anderson's record against Kasparov and Fischer wasn't as good. However, there was another world champion that played exactly opposite to Anderson. And I have that game. Well, I thought I did. Okay, against Mikhail Tall. And this game was also played in the 90s. Come on, get out of there. Thank you. And Anderson was white. Now, Anderson liked long, boring, strategical games, and Tall liked to sack all his pieces and meet you. So probably by move 15, you would get an idea who got the kind of game that they wanted, who got the kind of position they wanted. Okay, so Anderson plays knight f3 again. Bishop g5, it's a queen's gambit. Okay, and this is what I would call a boring way to play the queen's gambit for white. And I should know, because I play this with white. And the last three years or so, I haven't beaten anybody. All my games are draws. I, I got nothing. Although I did lose one. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, this is how people played for an advantage. Castles, rook c1. I've had this position too. c6, 
bishop d3, knight d7. And this is a line that I've had with white several times. Takes, takes. Still, I've, this is still what I play. What do I play here? h3 or rook e1? I think I play h3. Bishop b3. I've played that too. Takes, takes. Rook e8. And this is the kind of position that's going to be favorable to Anderson's kind of play because white is very, very slightly better. It should be a draw, but black is on the defensive because white has this nice bishop and black still has to develop his queen side. Queen d2. I've had, I've had this position also, but it's been a long time. Rook e1. Rook takes e1, giving up the e file. I'm not a fan of that. Bishop g4. So I think this way of playing for black with rook takes e1 and bishop g4, that's not the right way of playing. Typically, um, black is playing bishop f5 early in this line now. Then the bishop can safely go to g6 or h7. Um, but again, I'd rather have white because I like my nice bishop here on the diagonal. Tall tried to trade all the pieces to solve his problems but that's playing into Ulf Anderson's hands. Ulf is the one who wants to trade pieces and get a slight advantage and slowly, slowly, slowly improve his position. That's not what Tall's good at. Tall's not good at being slightly worse and defending, defending, and equalizing. Okay, knight e5, attacking f7. Whoops, not, not c. I keep pushing the wrong button. Attacking f7 twice, attacking the bishop on g4. That knight's got to go. Obviously, you can't take with the pawn because you lose your queen. So he has to take with the rook. We got rid of black's two bishops, and we traded pieces, and we still have this great bishop on this diagonal. Knight d7, kicking the rook out. Knight f6, h3. And again, I'm just taking white all day here. If white ever gets in trouble, I don't know why white would get in trouble, he can just play d5 and trade everything and the game is a draw, although I'd rather have white there also. But, okay, in case the d-pawn's getting weak or something. But the d-pawn isn't really under attack. It's defended. The rook is still on a8. I still have this open file. It's still better for white. Knight e4, the knight's coming to d6 or c5, so we have to trade. Now the white queen can go to e3 or f4. The rook can go to f4. Tremendous pressure here on this pawn on f7. Queen f8, queen f4, rook e8. Tall's trying to trade everything off to alleviate the pressure on his f-pawn, but again, that plays into Anderson's hands. King h2, and this looks like black should be able to draw by trading bishops, and if black never trades bishops, that bishop's very bad, and this bishop's really good. Anderson plays king h2, stopping queen e1 check forever, and now he has to keep a defensive as f7 pawn. So he plays a5, which is a mistake, weakening his queen side. Queen c7, attacking two pawns. Queen e4. So Tall doesn't want to defend and defend and defend. He wants to play actively. And in this position, Anderson played bishop f7 check. I'm not sure if Tall saw that. Tall was probably hoping for queen takes bishop, and he would play this perpetual. And if g3, then I have this perpetual. So he knew his bishop couldn't be captured, and he was hoping he'd play bishop e6 next, put pressure on this pawn. If I take on b7, I have queen f4 check. But this simple tactic just wins a pawn for white. Bishop f7 check. The queen is defending the diagonal, so there's no perpetual checks. And they go to a queen upon ending where white is a pawn up, but it looks pretty tough to win. But again, this is a clash of styles. And when you see this position, you think Olf Anderson would like this position, Tall would not. Tall's not sacrificing and attacking, he's down a pawn and defending. And Olf Anderson has an end game. Queen endings are notoriously drawn because of perpetual check chances. White's king is always got to watch out for perpetual check. King goes back to g8 to safety. Once again, black's threatening this perpetual. Queen f4, queen c1. 
So he plays king g3, stopping queen f4 check. And actually, what he'd like to do is hide behind black's pawns. Something like queen d3 check and run the king over here. And take these pawns while he's at it. And the king is actually safe in black's territory. b3, b5, check, check. Always repeat. Go Ulf Anderson. That's a lot of repeating. And then he played a4, not playing for the draw. Stopping black's pawns from moving down the board. Queen c3 defending his c6 pawn. Repeats again. Always repeat. Takes on b5. Time for some more repeating. Takes on b5. Takes on d4. And this position, funnily enough, and one of the reasons I want to look at this, we just saw this position about a week ago. And when I say we did, I mean I did. I don't know what you guys were doing. But um, there was a tournament, Super GM tournament, and Wesley So was white, and he was playing Jan Nipo Nishi. And they got the same endgame, three against two, with a pawn or two on the queen side. And it was a drawn position. The, en the engine said, draw, I'm an engine. And the player said, excuse me, we're not engines. And so ended up winning in like 100 moves. And I was thinking of Wolf Anderson when I saw that game. What Wesley kept repeating and trying to get something going. And eventually, in time trouble, because they were playing rapid chess, Nepomnishi messed up and so won. Almost the same endgame. Queen takes a5. Winning a second pawn. Queen d6 check. Here comes the perpetual check. Queen d4 check. Always play for perpetual check. And he plays king e2. His queen is stopping queen e5 check. His pawn is stopping queen c4 check. And now, if queen b2 check, he can block with his queen. So he's actually moving his king so his queen can come and block. Well, there's not many checks in this position. You don't want to be down two pawns. So he did give the one check. And now you can't take the pawn on b3, but you can't not take it. But it was his turn to move, so you got to make a move. And this was in a tournament to decide who was in the reserve for the candidates' matches. So this was a very important event. And if you don't take the pawn, you'll lose in 100 moves. If you take the pawn, you'll lose even quicker. Because if you don't take the pawn, you're down two pawns, and eventually white's going to win, but that would be a much longer game. Tall just took the pawn and hoped that the end game would be a draw. And I'm sure all of you on YouTube and on Discord and on Zoom and in the sky and the space station, you know what move white played in this position. And by the way, here's a good trick for you. If you're doing puzzles on the internet and this is the position, and you're thinking to yourself, Hmm, does queen d3 win? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Queen d3 is the answer to the puzzle. Because there is no other answer. Every other move does nothing. So, if, if it's a puzzle, queen d3 is the answer. If it's a tournament game, you probably should play queen d3 because the queen and pawn should be a draw. The king and pawn and it might be a win. And typically... Even with pawns on the same side of the board, if you have more pawns, you should be winning. And that's, I mean, I can't imagine a more Ulf Anderson-like game than this and a less Mikhail Tall kind of game. This is like suffering for Tall. And as an aside, I told you Ulf Anderson reminded me of Karpov and Sarawan, though his style. Um, Yasser Sarawan had an excellent score against Mikhail Tall, surprising. Something like four wins and a draw. So Tall had a bad record against Ulf Anderson and against Yasser. Styles clashed. Tall didn't get the kind of positions he wants. And he has to draw this lost endgame, which he didn't do. And after f5, he just resigned. The h5, I think, loses the game quickly because now my king can come in. And these endings where you trade pawns are always lost h4 because in this position it doesn't matter if it's white's move or black's move if it's white's move 
Well, it is black's move, but if it was white's move, white plays g3 and makes it black's move. And then black has to give way and gets his king shouldered out and so forth and loses his pawn. So he can never play g6, but he also can't allow king here, king here. So he's sort of stuck here. So he ended up resigning. A funny way to finish would have been like this. And then he's playing for stalemate. If you take on Poisson, it's stalemate. Unfortunately, you don't have to take on Poisson. And then this pawn's going to queen. So that would be bad. So after f5, Tall realized he's going to lose the game. Either the white king's going to come in, or we're going to win the king of pawn hitting two against one. So he resigned. A very Anderson S type of win. Anderson beat several world champions. And he did it by playing his style of chess. Sometimes he would sack an exchange or a pawn for positional play, but usually he would trade down, he'd be slightly better, and in a lot of games, they would end in a draw. I didn't show you those games. And a lot of people weren't fans of him because of that, but some people liked the way that he could play without risk and still beat world champions. Usually when you're playing so boring, you just lose or draw against somebody better than you. But there was nobody better. Ulf Anderson was great. And when I lived in St. Louis many years ago, there was a chess club member who was about 1900, 2000. And Ulf Anderson was his favorite player, which I thought was odd. But he really loved Ulf Anderson's games. That was his, somebody had, has to be their favorite player. Obviously, if you're Swedish, probably Ulf Anderson's one of your favorite players. He was the best player in Sweden for 30 years. Anyway, Ulf Anderson, the complete opposite of Adolf Anderson, living in a different time period and playing a different style of chess, but just as effective. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen. And we have sponsored lectures for the next several weeks. I'll be lecturing every Monday at 6. We want to thank your own paper for sponsoring this lecture. And for if you want to see more games by Ulf Anderson, obviously go to your database, go to the internet, and just make sure it's the right Anderson. Okay? The other Anderson spells his name differently, so you shouldn't have any problem. And also, if somebody sacrifices seven pieces, you're probably looking at the wrong Anderson game, especially if it's from the 1800s. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Thanks for watching our lecture. We'll have more great players of the past and present. Until next time, bye everybody.